We love you here at Cornerstone. How many people are glad to be together at church this morning? Amen. We're so glad to have you. Hey, welcome to Cornerstone. If we haven't met, my name is Jay. Celeste and I are so very happy to be part of an amazing team here of people in a community of faith. And we want to welcome you today to worshiping with us, both here in the room and online, as we are so glad to be worshiping together. Um, you know, part of what we do and what we talk about is use this image of Jesus because we are walking with Jesus. We're on a journey with him. None of us is perfect. All of us are on that journey. And, and we know that because we want to become more like Jesus, be more like Jesus. That is our focus because we know that we need to be more like him, his characteristics, and go where he is leading us to go. That's what it means to be a Christ follower or a Christian. And so that's who we are and that's what we're about. We do that collectively. Together, we love God, we make disciples, and we reach the world. That's why Pastor Rich was talking about giving above and beyond, being those who give so that other people around the world will know the love of Jesus Christ. And so we're very happy about that. We're excited to be those people who are on that mission together, and it's a blessing to be so. Um, I'll also say this, like part of what we do here beyond our weekend gatherings is that we meet throughout the week, throughout the city in life groups. And I want to encourage you to be a part of a life group that we'll, we're going to connect, grow, and serve together. We have groups, all sorts of types of groups that are meeting throughout the week. You can find them on the app, online, cornerstoneaz.org. I want to encourage you to join a part of it. It's not too late to start. They just started a few weeks ago. I know this. Tuesday, I had such a great conversation with our Bible, or with our book study that we're doing at, at lunch. And then I was as well the week before, part of the men's night out, guys' night out. It was awesome. We had such a great time. It was really fun together. So let me encourage you, find a place, get connected, grow in your relation with God, serve with your talents and abilities. You won't be disappointed. Would you say amen to that? Amen. Well, hey, we're starting a new series today. It is called Bad Friends. Bad Friends. And you're like, why would you name it Bad Friends? Well, because here's why. Because God has been friends with lots of bad friends. I mean, he's friends with you. And he's friends with me. And, you know, we all weren't lovely all the time, are we? He loved us. It says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so we're talking about this theme of bad friends, how throughout the scriptures, God has been friends with people who were bad friends themselves. And God is constant, and we are becoming more like him. And so we want to be those who learn to be a good friend and what it means to echo that instead of living in the past of what would be a bad friend. Now, we collectively, as a people of faith, have for many, many years, have these things that bring us together from all these different stories that we live, these walks of life. And we do so and have done so for a very long time, collected around what we believe in Christ. One of those things is the Apostles' Creed. It goes all the way back to 381 when the church was really kind of being cauterized and formed um, during that time. They were trying to say, okay, who, what does it mean to be a Christ follower? What does it mean to be those who believe and walk with Christ? And one of those things that's used is called the Apostles' Creed. It's kind of a precursor to the Nicene Creed. And, and many people within the Protestant faith, this is something that they use uh, as a liturgy, a, a way to recite this or they, they declare this as part of their worship. Now, within our circles, it's not a normal thing that we do, but we would for this series like to do this as a way for us to talk about and, and profess what we believe in the Lord. We'll look at the words for just a minute. It talks about who we believe in as God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It talks about who Christ is for us, the one who came as the sacrifice for mankind, and that he rose again. It talks about him conquering uh, hell and talking about being the one who comes back to life. It talks about the Catholic Church, little c. It means global church, that we belong to the global church of believers in Christ Jesus. And so what it does is it talks about how we believe not just in that, but in the resurrection for all those, the great hope that we have in Jesus Christ for each person and so because of this, we can read this and declare this. Now, many people do this as part of their weekly worship. But if you do it without the meaning, the words don't mean anything. But if you do it with the meaning, these words mean a lot. So let's be intentional today. We're going to read this together today. And then we'll go into our scripture. Let's read it together. 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, descended into hell, rose again from the dead on the third day, ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, who will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Would you say amen? Amen. It is an amazing statement of faith, and that's a blessing to us to be able to look at it and agree with people across the world in who we are as belonging to Jesus Christ. Today, if you have your Bible, your tablet, your phone, we're going to open up the scriptures ourselves and be looking at a story from Exodus starting in chapter 33, verse 11. We pick up here, and it says, Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. The question we're asking today is this, are you a friend of God? Are you a friend of God? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for speaking to us. Lord, we pray that you would breathe upon it by your Holy Spirit, that you would illuminate it in our lives. Lord, that we would go away from this place changed more into your image and your character. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so bad friends. Man, I know, uh, man, there's been times in my life where I felt really lonely. Have you guys ever felt lonely? Lonely, I'm so lonely. You guys know what I'm talking about. You feel that way. You feel lonely. And man, I remember I was, uh, I was at school, I was in university in California, and, and it, was, it was a crazy time. I was alone. I was on these boats. I was, what I had done was I had worked all these three, four jobs trying to pay for school in California. My dad said, maybe he's like, hey, I heard about a job. It's a friend from here has a boat in, in California, Redondo Beach, he needs someone to wax the boat. And I'm like, Shh, I can wax a boat. I mean, I'm like a prof professional boat waxer person guy. That's me. Not thinking about, like, I totally underbid this job. He's like, huh, hey, will you do it for this much money? And he was like, completely, you know, took advantage of me because I didn't have any tools. I was not ready for the job, you know. Like, he, he ended up paying somebody way more probably to fix my mistakes. But the whole point was like, I'm like, oh, yeah, I can do it. I can do it. But it's the middle of winter, it's cold, it's windy, it's rainy, I'm out there by myself. No one's hanging out on the boat in winter time. That's not how it works. I'm in a group of one out there by myself. My friends are back home with their parents, or out snowboarding together on a trip, and they're sending me pictures, even on the terrible flip phones back in the day. Remember the flip phone where you had like four megapixels, and you're like, is that an image? What is that? They would send me, it'd be like them snowboarding, and I'm like, ah, and I felt so alone. And I thought about how lonely I felt. And the reason I was thinking about this is because of how cold it is in California right now. Have you guys seen how cold it is in California? It is freezing over on the freeway. It's like hell was freezing. I mean, it was freezing over in California on the freeway. Just a joke. Just a joke. Meanwhile, I was reading this on my phone, and Javen and I were enjoying a baseball game in the sun because we live in Arizona, Arizona. People are sitting out on the grass enjoying getting a suntan because we live in the promise land. So thank you, Jesus. But going back to here, so I'm alone by myself. I'm in the, on this boat. I'm like buffing this boat on the water line. It's terrible. It's a terrible, terrible thing. And so I'm there and I felt so alone, man. This felt like dejected. And I realized, I was like, man, I don't have any friends that are even close to here. And I looked down and kind of looked where I was at and figured it out that, hey, I'm, I'm here. And my friend, he lives in Inglewood right by here, my friend Izzy. So I'll reach out to Izzy and see what's up, see if I can connect with Izzy. And so, man, I did. And, and here's the thing. I met Izzy from playing pickup hoops at school, at college. 
Now, all of us who did pick up hoops, we all thought, like, we just got looked over by the scouts for college because we should have been in the game. You know what I'm talking about? We had handles, and we were out there doing the thing. I mean, I grew up, you know, like, 1993 Suns slash, you know, Chicago Bulls, Air Jordan. Like, oh, I was, you know, I was in it. I was like, you know, prof- you know the professor and one mixtape. I'm out there doing dribbles and stuff. I had it. So I knew Izzy from there, so I hit up Izzy. I was like, hey, man, I'm here and nearby, and, and I don't want to put, like, I'm lonely, man. Like, you know, it's just like, he's like, yeah, yeah, come through. I'll, I'll actually, I'll come get you. I was like, oh, you know, it was, like, so good that he would come and scoop me up. And so he, got, he came and got me and took me to his house, his little apartment, and his mom, man, she, I, she opened the door, and you could feel the glory of the Lord was coming because there was she was cooking in the house, and I was like, oh, you could feel the warmth of the tortillas being made. I was like, oh, this is the one. I have found it. I have found the place. This is great. And so I come in, man. They made a spot for me and cleaned off the table, invited me in with their family, and fed me, and I got to be a part of them. And I wasn't alone anymore. And there's such a powerful thing about including others into your life and including others into your family and making room for someone at the table. And so, you know, Izzy's like, hey, man, I was planning to go and hoop it up, you know, if you want to go. I mean, you know, and I was like, of course, man, let's go. Let's run it, baby. We're going to run it on them. You know, I had all this courage until we showed up where we went. And we showed up, and there's like a school that they would open up the gym on the weekend. It was like a free-for-all, free open court, and they would play at the gym. And I'm thinking, dude, what a pickup game, some local guys. I'm going to play with these guys, no big deal. We walk in. I'm not joking. There's between 500 and 600 fans sitting in the bleachers at the gym. It was a huge gym, full, huge, huge things all the way to the roof. People, it was like playing a major game like I was in the finals of the NBA. It was wild. And I was like, I walk in, I'm the only one close to my shade of Caucasia. You know what I'm talking about? I was like, this is not a big deal. I was just like, oh, snap. And they're kind of looking at me like, who's this kid? And I walk in, and I was like, uh. And you know how suddenly, like, when you don't feel your game is strong, you're like, my knee, kind of feeling my knee and my back. Man, my, my shooting wrist is kind of, man, I'm maybe using the buffer on the boat. I'm kind of, I'm going to sit down for a little bit. He's like, are you sure you don't, I got a spot for you, you can run right now. I'm like, I'm going to watch you. I'm going to watch you right now. I'm going to cheer for you. And so Izzy, man, he, this is his hood. Like he goes and he starts playing. He's hooping just like normal. And I'm, I do not have the courage. I'm like watching and like there's people like, and they're looking at me like, who's this guy? And I'm like, um, I'm with him. That's my friend. That's my friend right there. I'm with him. That's my friend. I am not alone. You guys know what I'm talking about? And here's the thing, whenever you're with somebody and they're really your friend, you're not alone. And that's how it is with our relationship with God, because he never leaves us alone. And so whenever we're close, he says it's close to us, he's close to us. And that's what it means to never be alone, because God is with you. But not just that, but that's also how we are called to be as the church to each other and to those in faith is called to be a brother, a sister in Christ, called to leave not them alone, but to include them in our family. And you think about your group, uh, your group of friends. You think about your group of friends and who you would say are close to you. Most social scientists say it's between three to 10 or 12 people at max that are like a close friend to you. And that's pretty normal. So a lot of times if you never leave like your hometown, a lot of those friendships are already built in and you don't really, you have kind of that group and that's your group and that's your group because you already have that closeness. So whenever other people come, like you can add on lots of acquaintances, but you're not really tight with anybody outside of that circle. But what, as Christ followers, what's challenged for us is to add one more friend. It's a challenge to add one more friend, and because we want to include people that come and become a part of the family of God and part of our community. We want to add them to our friends and really be friends with them. And I know that's hard because that's a stretch, but man, it's such a true thing. Internationally, several of us that have been in the room have lived internationally. You realize, even though your friends and family are back home and you love them, you're close to them, that time you spend day to day starts to get shaved off and you, you arrive in a new place. You have openness for new relationships. And so you're looking like, huh, 
can I have a friend? Can I have a friend? And man, you become friends. I know Laura and other people can tell you that you become friends with people you never didn't really have much in common with, but you become tight with them because you're going through something similar and you needed a friend and they needed a friend and you become friends. And see, that's the same thing for us walking in this path with Jesus is that we're on the same journey together. Let's be friends with one another. Let's make room for one more friend. I know what you're thinking. You're like, Jay, dude, you're a talker, man. You would talk to anybody. You'll talk to the wall if no one's here. You know what I mean? And I am a quiet person, right? I talk to one person a week. I will go the rest of the week, talk to one more person. I'm totally fine, right? (laughs) Different personality ties, different thing. I get that. But here's the thing. He calls all of us to stretch to add one more friend. So let's be those that when new people come, when new people engage in your life, maybe they're not even here, maybe it's life group or in your community, wherever it is, that you would be the one that's intentional to be one more friend. Amen? Amen. So as we're looking at this and we kind of go forward into Scripture, we start to look at what it means to actually make a good friend. What makes a good friend? In Scripture, Almost everyone points first and foremost to Abraham. And and you can see this picked up here in James 2. It says it like this. You see that faith was active along with his works. And faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God. And it was counted to him as righteousness. He was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Now, this is very important because for us, we see that Abraham is someone who's established in faith. What is he called? The father of the faith. We're called to look to him as an example of one who walked by faith. And it says it was accounted to him that he was a friend of God. What an amazing thing to be said about you. But it says that not only was he did that by faith, but he also did that in how he lived his life or his works. So it's how he obeyed the Lord. Now remember, it's the order by which it is. By faith, we are accepted. And by faith, we, we accept the work of Christ for us. It's not that we do it the reverse way. We can't work our way into it. So you can't earn the grace of God. You can't do enough good things. You cannot, by the holiness of God, you can't do it. But Jesus, having great compassion and grace for us. He went and paid the price for us so we could be accepted back into relationship with the Father by accepting his sacrifice through faith. And because of that, we get to walk according to what he's directing us to do in our actions or by our works. And as we do this, we live as unto God. We are living for God but we're not earning it. We're doing it as a rejoicing, as a celebration, as a worship of the Lord most high, a friend of God, a friend of God. Now, here's what's powerful about that. I love the song. We sing it. I love it. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. What a powerful statement. What a powerful statement. And it's true. But here's the thing, we don't want to get it conflicted with this idea of God's my buddy, oh pal, oh friend of mine. Because he's the holy God, our creator. And so it says it like this in scripture, and it talks about wisdom in Proverbs 15. It says, the fear of the Lord is instruction in wisdom, and humility comes before honor. So what does that mean? It means the fear of the Lord is one that we should have. It's an inherent, not a fear like, oh, I'm dead. It's a fear, a reverence, an awe. Like when we say the word awesome, I grew up in the time of the Ninja Turtles. Awesome is just, we say it about everything. You know what I mean? It's like tubular, awesome. It's like it loses its value. But in real, it means you stand in awe, in amazement of God. Because he is all-powerful, the God, our creator, and all these things holds time and space in his hands. And because of that, the way that we view our creator God, we stand with a, a fear, a respect, a reverence of the Lord. And when we do that, and we humble ourselves and not have ourselves be built up in pride, 
then he will lift us up to the place of honor that we're really looking for. See, if you do it backwards, then you do it the way that Satan did it because he was in the presence of God and experiencing the worship of God flowing through him as an instrument of God and started thinking it was him. And if we do that too, and we don't have the fear of the Lord, then we forget where the source comes from. And it will be our demise. So because of that, we don't want to do that. We want to be those who are full of the, of the fear of the Lord and full of the glory of the Lord because we are walking in faith and living that way for God as our works. It talks about like this in Galatians 3. It says it for all of us. It says there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's never, neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Would you say amen to that? Amen. Man, you think about it like this. So it talks about you're neither Jew nor Greek. This is a big deal because as you think about it, all of these things that are happening in the New Testament are done so for the children of God or the lineage of the Jews. And so anyone who's not 100% Jewish would be over here in column B known as the Gentiles, or in this case, they talk about the Greeks. And so anyone who's not that, which include myself and many other people in this room, would be those included as the Greek or as the Gentiles outside of the chosen people of God. Now, here's the amazing thing. We read about it in Scripture by the impartation of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, that it says the Holy Spirit fell upon all these people from all these different places that were coming. First, those who become Jews, and then in Acts 10, upon even the Gentiles, meaning all the rest of us. And it said that we didn't have to become Jews in order to experience it, but by faith, which is faith, by faith, we were made righteous before the Lord. It becomes the circumcision of our hearts, the inclusion of us, not the replacement of, but the grafting in of the Gentiles into the promise that was made for the children of God. I'm so very thankful. And because it talks about it like that, then that means that we get to be those who receive the same promises that were there for Abraham, the same promises that were made for him. Genesis 12, it says that it came and, and the Lord spoke to Abram and said, you will leave your family and your father's house and go to the place I will show you. And if you walk by faith and do these things according to your faith, then guess what? I will bless you. I will bless your family and I will make you a multitude. I will curse those that curse you and I will be for you. That's the same promise that is yours, that is mine. Because of our faith in Christ, we're brought into the family of God. He calls us friend. What a powerful thing. What a powerful thing. So as we ask this question, are you a friend of God? We have to look and see what does it mean to be a good friend? And we've talked about Abraham as an example of a good friend. Well, there's lots of examples of bad friends. People that you wouldn't want to be caught being friends with. But here's the thing, God is good to bad friends. How many people know that's true? God is good even to bad friends. The example we're talking about today is Moses. Now, Moses is awesome. Moses had an awesome beard. I mean, he's awesome. Think about it. Man, what a crazy, crazy thing. We pick up in this scripture in Exodus 33. It says, thus the Lord spoke, to, used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend, as a man speaks to his friend friend. What a powerful thing to see the Lord face to face. Now you got to think about the timeline and the, and the story that's there. The Lord made a way for the children of Israel, and he did that by using and elevating Joseph and the story of Joseph in the land of Egypt. Now, Joseph didn't get there of his own accord. He was sold into slavery by his brothers. They faked his death and sold him into slavery, and he elevated, and he got put into prison, and then he got elevated, and he gave some, some kind of dream interpretation to some guys, and they elevated him to the point that he got to speak to the Pharaoh. And the Pharaoh heard the wisdom of God coming from Joseph and elevated him to not just save what would be the future of all of the house of God, all of the children of Israel, which happened, but also as a result, save Egypt too. 
And he did that by putting aside food during the times of plenty for the famine that was ahead. And this elevated him to a great place. And it meant that as he brought his brothers back, they lived in Egypt and they grew and were made a mighty people. Well, this made the people who ran the spot, the Egyptians, very nervous because they saw the children of Israel who by then had been subjugated and made into slaves. They saw them growing in power, growing in strength, growing in number, and this scared them. So they decided to kill the children, to cull the males from being able to revolt in the future. And so as they did this, I mean, it's a a terrible thing, a terrible thing. And Moses gets born into this timeline, and it picks up with him here, Moses, the miracle. It says, now a man from the house of Levi went and took his wife, a a Levite woman. And the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months And when she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and dabbed it with bitumen and pitch. And she put the child in it and placed it amongst the reeds of the river bank. Now you think about this story and this idea. She couldn't hide him anymore. Obviously, he's growing. He's becoming bigger, becoming louder as a baby, right? All the moms and the dads of young children, aunts and uncles, anyone around a young baby knows exactly what I'm talking about. A little cry because, ah! You're like, we're putting him in the bulrushes. Here you go, kiddo. No, no, no. They're putting him there as, as a salvation. Like, Lord, please. And this is amazing. And I was, in the, I, was, I was in the Nile. I was in the Nile a month ago. And I was there in the Nile in Sudan where the, the two headwaters, the blue and the, and, the, and the white Nile, come together to make the Nile that goes to Egypt. And I was at the headwaters there thinking about this story. And I was thinking about all these massive crocodiles that I've seen them mummify in Egypt back in the day and the hippos and all the crazy stuff that was in the water back then. And I was like, yikes. You know, we think about the baby in the basket versus the water. I'm thinking crocodile, baby. She puts him in a basket, puts him there in the water. And it's a situation where she does so with the wisdom of the Lord because that's the place where the princess would go and take a bath. And so she's there with her security and all the stuff. And and here comes the baby basket and bumps into this princess. And she's like, oh, it's a baby. And she had compassion on him. And she loved him and picked him up. And she adopted Moses into her royal family. So the slave becomes royalty by the provision of God. And she calls him Moses because she drew him up out of the water. It becomes a type and a symbolism of salvation, a type and a symbolism of baptism, of coming out of the water, being dead, and being made alive anew. And so for us, we see the story of him. He's the miracle. He's the miracle. Man, one of these who who is a slave is now elevated. He's taught in that way and groomed in that way and has the authority in that way. And then he made his mistake. And he becomes Moses the murderer. And it picks up in Scripture, and it continues a little further on. It says, One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens, and he saw the Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. And he looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian. And he hid him in the sand. We think about how often we make mistakes, we sin against God when we're angry. We make mistakes and things that we wouldn't do otherwise. But we do them in our, in our anger. In those heightened emotional moments, we do things that we can't take back. And in his case, he did exactly that. And of course, he immediately feels the shame. And so he hides it. He hides it. And so do we. we try to hide our shame and hide our sin and hide our mistakes. But here's the thing. People know. People knew in his day too. And they, they knew right away that he had killed someone. And it got found out. And they said, oh, he was telling, trying to correct them, saying, why are you hitting each other? You shouldn't do this to your brother. Are you going to kill us too? And he realized people knew what was happening. And he ran for his life in shame. Away from the promise, away from the provision, away from the house of Pharaoh, where he had power, where he had prominence, where he had position, and he ran from that because of the mistakes he made. 
And he ran out to Sinai and to Saudi, and there he found a wife and a family, became a, became a shepherd. But see, God was not done with Moses yet. Here's the thing. We all make mistakes, myself included. But you are not your mistakes. You are not your past. You are the future in Jesus Christ. And so you have a future that's bright, that's better than the one you can think for yourself. You may have to deal with the decisions that you made with, but guess what? It doesn't define who you are as a person or the value that God has on your life or the trajectory by which he wants to do through your life to bless others. But first you have to realize it. And that's what happened in the life of Moses. He becomes Moses the shepherd. And there the Lord speaks out to him from a burning bush, one that was burning but would not burn up. It says in Exodus 3, it says, The Lord saw that he had turned aside to see. God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. He said, I am the God your father the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. He said, take off your sandals, come to this place, because it is holy ground. Why? What he's saying is, become vulnerable before me. Humble yourself before me. Draw close to me. Because I have something to say to you. This is the same that he has for you. The same thing. The thing that made the ground holy was not just the place it was. It was the presence of the most high God. And that's exactly what we experience today is that he wants us to come, to humble ourselves, to come to this place where he, we draw in. And of course, what does he do? He hides his face because he knows the glory of the Lord. He knows the shame he has. But here's the amazing thing, that it's God who lifts him up and calls him to another place. It's God who dusts him off from his past and calls him to a greater future than the one he had planned for himself living as a shepherd in Saudi for the rest of his life. God called him to be a liberator and a leader for the children of God to re-go back to the things he had spoke over them in, in his past and to become the man of God he was supposed to be. This is what he has for you as well. That he has something great for you, but you first have to come and to draw near to God, abandon everything that would protect you, that would keep you back. You have to remove that stuff and come to God humbly. And he will come near to you. And he will lift you up. It says that the Lord challenged Moses. Moses becomes the liberator. And he sucks. He speaks to him here and he says, And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me. And I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to the Pharaoh. And you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. He was calling Moses to face his fear. He calls you to face your fear as well. The brokenness that we experience because of the fear that keeps us immobilized from following Jesus, if we actually bring those things, those fears to him and draw close to God, he will walk with us through those places. It says, in the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. It's so interesting that he would use a shepherd to shepherd the people of God to safety. It's so interesting that he would use a shepherd boy to become the, the greatest king that we see in his lineage to become the greatest king. And eventually Jesus to be the good shepherd for all people for all time. All because of the obedience to humble and to draw close to God. He had to be there first with God and himself before he could ever lead anyone else there. 
He couldn't lead anybody out of their fear to face the Red Sea, to face the army, to face famine in a desert, to face all those things. He couldn't lead them there if he didn't face his fears first. But he dealt with those things step by step. And then what does the scripture say? Scripture says that after those things and after the miracles and after the plagues and after the Red Sea, as he met with God, he spoke to God no longer in shame covering his face. He spoke to God face to face as a friend. And so the question for you today is are you a friend of God? Do you have anything holding you back from really being a good friend of God? You know, today we're going to invite the the worship team to come, and as we look to the scripture, we see that our challenge is to stay close to God. We see that our challenge is to answer that question, what makes a good friend? And we know what it means. It's really embracing the work of Christ on our behalf, really embracing what he wants to do through us. And since that's true, then we can't skirt this question, the question that each one of us has to answer, which is, have you embraced Jesus? No one can answer it for you. It is your question to answer. But it's one that I challenge you to answer today to invite him into your heart and life. It will change your life. It will change everything you're looking for. See, the cross is a symbol, one of freedom for us because it's at the cross that Jesus became the sacrifice for all people for all time. Scripture says that he took on the sin of the world and he paid for it on the cross. And because he did that, he made a way for us to reconnect to the Father. And it's by faith that we embrace what he's done on our behalf. In scripture, it says it like this in Romans 10, 9 and 10. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified. With the mouth one confesses and is saved. See, today is your day of salvation. Today is your day to embrace Jesus, to invite him into your heart and life, to start a new relationship with him, one that will really change you forever. I'm gonna ask if everyone that's here in the room, if you just stand right where you're at, and you just bow your head. If you're online, you just prepare your heart as well. Maybe you're there making a decision to follow Jesus. Friends, is that you and no one's looking at you? But if that's you and you want to make that decision today, maybe it's for the very first time or maybe you need to recommit your heart back to Christ. Maybe you've made a decision in the past, but you haven't been living for God. And you want to make a a recommitment to the Lord today. If that's you, because no one's looking, if you just want to raise your hand right where you are, just say, you know, preacher, include me in that prayer. I see the hand that's there and the hand that's there. Another hand that's there. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Friends, if you're making that decision, we, we rejoice with you as these that are making a decision. Four hands that are here. Friends, it's not a magic words, but it is a prayer from the heart, one intentional. It's a prayer that goes something like this. Lord, thank you for loving me. And thank you for sending Jesus. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And I believe he rose again. Forgive me of my sins. I surrender my life to you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. If that was you, I am rejoicing with you today, friend, as you made a decision to follow Jesus, a recommitment to live for Jesus. What a powerful thing. What a powerful thing. For all of us, it's a challenge that we would be those who aren't a bad friend, but a good one. That we would be those who have the intimacy with God where we can look him face to face as we draw near to him and says he draws near to us. But first, we need to be those that humble ourselves. We thirst after righteousness. We come to him, abandoning these other protections that we would keep back but handing over all those things, asking him to forgive us of where we've gone wrong, of where we committed sin, of where we've been against him.
but draw near to the Lord. I would challenge you that during this song, during this time, if that's you, or maybe you just want more of the Lord, more of his presence, more of his blessing, that you would come and make an altar with God and draw near to him. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word, which you breathe upon by your spirit. We thank you, Lord, for illuminating in our hearts. God, we thank you, Lord, for the challenge that we see, Lord, in the life of Moses. Lord, I thank you for his courage, Lord, to face his fears, Lord, and to be obedient to the things that you had for him. Lord, I thank you that he didn't end up as a mistake and as those things that we see as a shame, but instead, Lord, you lifted him from those things. Lord, and you had a future which became a liberation for many, for multitudes and millions upon millions of people because of his obedience. In the same way, Lord, I pray you empower us, Lord, in this moment, Lord, to draw close to you. Lord, and forgive us for where we've gone wrong. Forgive us for where we made mistakes, where we've sinned against you. Lord, and fill us by your Holy Spirit as we draw near to you. Lord, we want to see you face to face. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I open up this altar to you today, friends. Amen. Amen. I want to encourage you that you have an incredible week this week. As you head out, grab an invite card. Invite one more friend. Make a friend this week. Give them a card. Let them know you have a seat for them. And also join a life group. It's not too late. You can look online on the app or on the website. It'll give you a list. You can email the leader, find out where they're meeting or if they're online only. And just jump in this week and be a part. Amen. Before we go, let's pray his blessing over us. The Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Lord, I pray a blessing upon your church, your people. That you pour your spirit out upon us so we can live your love out to those around us. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Know this. We love you very much here at Cornerstone. God bless you and have a great week.